we see evidence of, of dramatic discontinuity in the fossil record and dramatic discontinuity in the genomic um, record. The, the genes of different organisms are much more dis disparate than we thought even, even 20 years ago. I'd love to talk a little bit about evolution because, you know, there's a sense in which you think about how different breeds of dogs are created even through breeding. And you can, uh, you know, the, the famous example is the woolly sheep in the coldest climates, you know, the ones that aren't as woolly die off. So the wooliest sheep mate with one another and create woollier sheep, right? So that's change over time. That's a, a sen in a sense in which people might use the word evolution for that. But what is the, you know, what is the definition of evolution? as far as what we might talk about in this context and how does that interact with the science of intelligent design? Oh, that is a fantastic question, Alyssa. And it's where a lot of the confusion comes in because the word evolution can mean many different things. And you can provide um, evidence in support of evolution in one sense that's very strong that doesn't actually support evolution in some other sense. So it, there's a fallacy of equivocation. So three, three key Def, uh, different ways of defining evolution. The first is change over time. Uh, do biological systems change over time? Yes, they do, no question. Um, and there's different ways in which we could d even define change over time. We could think of the change that occurs with things like a population of sheep responding to changes in the environment, or Darwin's famous uh, finches that where the beaks got a little longer, a little shorter, changed shape a little bit this way and that in response to varying weather patterns and what they had available to eat. Uh, if, if there was only the really hard shelled nuts, then the, then the finches with the longer beaks survived more than the ones with the shorter beaks. So, you know, that you have this, this type of modest change within the, within the limits of a pre-existing gene pool is what it turns out to be. Uh, and sometimes that's called microevolution. You also have change over time in the sense that the, the living forms that are on the planet today are not identical to the forms of life that have lived during the Jurassic or the Cretaceous period. As much as I lament it, we do not have any dinosaurs running around today, <laughs> which was, you know, the, and so the forms of life, we don't have trilobites such as existed in the Cambrian period. So there are many the, the representation of life forms on the planet is different now than it was a long time ago. That's also a form of change over time. Nobody disputes that meaning of evolution. A second meaning of evolution is the idea that the change that has occurred on planet Earth in living forms has been gradual and continuous, such that the picture of life that we see is best represented by a kind of branching tree picture. And this was one of the, the, the ways that Darwin depicted how he envisioned the evolutionary process. So you start with one or very few simple forms, a simple one-celled organism, it gradually becomes more and more complex. It becomes a multicellular organism. And then you th those organisms uh, evolve and morph and change and eventually have all the forms of life we see today. But they've arisen through a slow, gradual process and, and such that all the forms of life today are related by common ancestry going back to that, that very first simple form or forms. Uh, and that's sometimes called the theory of universal common descent or universal common ancestry. So you've got change, that's one meaning, but then you have the idea of continuous change such that the picture of the history of life is best represented as a branching tree. Now, that meaning is, um, well, let's get to the third meaning. The third meaning then is the idea that the process that has produced that continuous change is completely unguided and undirected such that the appearance of design that we see in living organisms is an illusion. It's just an appearance because an unguided process, natural selection acting on random variations and mutations, produce that little bit by bit gradual change over long periods of time. And that explains all the new form that's arisen in the history of life and the appearance of design that those new forms exhibit. So the theory of intelligent design is challenging that third meaning of evolution. Many of us are skeptical about the second meaning of evolution as well, the idea of universal common ancestry. We see evidence of, of dramatic discontinuity in the fossil record and dramatic discontinuity in the genomic um, record. The, the genes of different organisms are much more dis 
disparate than we thought even, even 20 years ago. There's something called orphan genes, a fantastic new discovery that suggests discontinuity at both the genetic and at the fossil level. So that would challenge the idea of universal common descent. But that's not our, our principal, um, uh, the, the principal thing to w- that we are challenging. We are challenging the idea that there's a purely unguided, undirected mechanism that can produce all the new form of, forms of life we see and the appearance of design that they manifest. And so that is, in a sense, where you can contrast the idea of apparent design produced by natural selection, the unguided process of natural selection, with the idea of intelligent design. That's where the real argument is taking place and where we, we are um, developing, uh, I think, uh, very powerful arguments for intelligent design and showing that the, the appearance of design in nature is in many, many cases demonstrably real. It's the product of intelligence, not an undirected directed process. Mm-hmm.